Welcome to Ray's Reflection, the Common Man's Bible Study. Today we are still traveling back to Jerusalem with the Apostle Paul on his third missionary journey. Up to this point, we have been looking at the opposition and we've been blaming Satan. Uh, there are three oppositions to God. One is Satan and all his dominions. Two is the world, or what we call the world system, or the cosmos. And that would include things like religion, human logic, uh, education, philosophies, things like that. And the third thing, believe it or not, is ourselves. And as Paul is traveling here, you will see that the opposition to the work of God doesn't come from Satan. And it doesn't come from the world. It comes from inside Christianity. It comes from those who love Paul. And they are misguided. And we have to understand that when mankind is saved, when individuals are saved, up to the point that they have been saved, they are thinking like the world. They are us using the logic of the world. They are using all the things that the world would use to evaluate situations and make decisions. And now they get saved, and all of a sudden we naively think that, ah, that now they have the Holy Spirit, now they have the ability to understand all spiritual things. And they don't. Uh, jo Gospel of John clearly teaches us that we are separated, or we are set apart, or what the Bible uses the word sanctified, right, by the word, or by truth. And therefore, the more you are exposed to truth, the more separated you become in your thinking, and in, in, therefore in your actions. So consequently, you have people who get saved, and never are, are, are rarely exposed to the Word, and therefore they think and they act and they reason very much like the world. And therefore we have a group of people here who are young in church, and the Scripture's not been completed yet. So therefore, they can't be exposed to the Word as much as, let's say, a person in the 20th century. So, we have a problem. How do they reason? Well, they reason very much the way they've always reasoned. And even though they are loving, and they believe their reasoning is loving, it is anti-God. It is opposed to the work of God. It is opposed to the plan of God. And therefore, we will see this. And it's sad, but the very actions of these people are reflected today. And, and, and we'll get to that. Okay, so let's take his journey and see where he's going. It says, And it came to pass that after we were parted from them, and had put to sea, we came with a straight course unto Kos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from there unto Patra. And finding a ship, we sailed over unto Phoenicia, and went abroad, set forth. Now if you look at this carefully, you will see, um, I'll give you another thing. Now see, Petra is here, etc. Kosh would be up in, up in here. Kosh would be a little island right in here. And what he's doing is he's hopping. He's, he's, he's moving very slowly along the coast. He, he's hugging the coast. So probably what you're seeing is you're seeing him travel by a small sailboat that would not get away from the sight of land, and it would travel maybe 60, 70 miles a day, and at night it would put into port and resupply itself, and then the next day it would set out again for another uh, hop, and so on. Before he crosses the Mediterranean, he will get here, he will, ho he will hook on a larger ship, much larger ship that will, that will carry them, him all the way here to, to the... Phoenicia or to Caesarea in Syria. And, but, but until then, that's what, he's, that's what he's traveling. Now, what is he doing? He is literally avoiding what he was warned about. He was warned about that there was a plan to kill him, and he's traveling with a lot of money. A lot of money that he has collected from the Christians in Asia and Macedonia. And now he's bringing it to the, to the Christians in Jerusalem. And this is a tremendous, tremendous act. 
the Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles, and vice versa, the Gentiles had nothing to do with the Jews. They, they, they really didn't get along. And now all of a sudden you will see that Gentile Christians are now helping or giving a large sum of money to the Jews in Jerusalem, the Christians in, Jer in, in, in Jerusalem. And it is a tremendous um, gift, it's, it's a tremendous way to bring unity together. And uh, you will see th uh, this, this happening. And it says this, it says, now when they, when they had sighted Cyprus, we left it on the left hand. Now you will notice that they're traveling this way here. Cyprus would be here. It, it would be on their left hand. They would pass. They would pass within sight of Cyprus. And he says this. And we sailed to Syria. Now Syria is here, down in here. That's Syria. Now he traveled to Syria, and he landed at Tyra, for there the ship was to unload her cargo, and that would take uh, a while. It would take probably about a week for them to unload that cargo. He says, in finding the disciples, he says, we tarry there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem. This passage of Scripture has been so maligned. And it has been maligned because the language. People use the English version to interpret this passage. And they look at this and they say, the Spirit, well, the Spirit is capital letters. And therefore, these, the Spirit told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. That's not true. He says, and, and uh, we look at this, and, and I've heard sermons. I've heard sermons saying that Paul was wrong to go to Jerusalem, and therefore, when he got to Jerusalem, he was captured and eventually ended up in Rome at a trial, and he eventually lost his head. And that was all because he disobeyed the Spirit. And that is not true at all. What is, what was Paul told by Jesus Christ from the very beginning at his conversion? That he would be sent to kings? And he hasn't spoken to any kings yet. He would speak to the uh, different people. He would receive punishment. He would receive opposition, and uh, certainly he has. And therefore, Paul was not afraid. He certainly didn't like it, as we saw in Athens. But he knew what his purpose was, and he knew what his goal was. And we will see him ex recite this. But what happened here is this. In the early church, before the, uh, the scriptures were completed, there were prophets and prophetesses. People whom God would speak to or give a vision to or send some kind of message to. And most of the time, most of the this these prophets were not speaking doctrine. They were given prophecies about things to come, especially, mostly were events of things that were going to happen. And that was to help the help the church understand and how and help the church act properly in this new church and and because they had no scriptures to turn to, uh, no New Testament to turn to, I should say. They had the Old Testament. And these prophets got a message from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit showed those prophets what would happen to Paul when he got to Jerusalem. Now, that, that's what it is. And, because, and, and, this, and the Spirit showed Paul, not Paul, rather, showed the prophets what Paul would experience in Jerusalem. Now, they saw what Paul would experience in the Jerusalem, and because of their love for Paul, because they didn't want him to experience this, they told him that the Spirit had told them not to go to Jerusalem, and the Spirit had not told them that. They had simply saw what was going to happen in Jerusalem, and they were afraid for Paul. And when that, we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till they were out of the city. And uh, that is very common. Uh, it was a common practice when the guest came into your house and you, he stayed with you for a while, etc. And then when he left, etc., you walked with him for a ways 
and it, a sign of su support. And we knelt down on the shore, and it says here, and we prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. In other words, we got back on the ship and we sailed on. Now it's interesting. This is the first time loved ones have urged Paul not to fulfill God's will. Think about it. And they're not, they're not being devious about it. They're not being anti-gospel about it. They, they're doing it out of a sense of love for Paul, but in, the, in, in looking at that and allowing their emotions to control them, they're forgetting the command of God to Paul. They're forgetting the plan of, of, of God that, uh, that God showed Paul. And uh, this happens all the time. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll expound on it in the next section. It says this, And when we had finished our course from Tyra, we came to Ptolemus and greeted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we... <clears throat> We that were at Paul's company departed, and we came to Caesarea. Now, you know where Caesarea is. Caesarea is not very far from Jerusalem. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. And it says, who was one of the seven? One of the seven what? If you go back to Acts chapter 6, you will remember that there was a, a division in the church between the Greeks and, and uh, the Jews, and therefore deacons were selected. And they selected seven deacons, seven men of good reputation, seven men who were uh, good leaders. And one of those men was Philip. And here he is in Caesarea. And his, his ministry is in Caesarea. And so they stayed with him. And they abode with him. So when they say, uh, he's one of the seven, I've got an itch. And the same man had four daughters and virgins who did prophesy. Now you will notice that these daughters of Philip were prophetess. In other words, they got messages from God and they related to the people to encourage them, to, to steer them in the right direction and so on. He says, as we tarried there, yeah, you can see where Caesarea is, Tyra, and, and down at Caesarea, that's way down, way down in here, Jerusalem is right there, so we're not very... Paul's not very far from ending his, his journey here. He says this, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Now, Agabus comes down. This is, this is Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus said the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this belt, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, Agabus obviously was a prophet, and God had spoken to him, and God had shown him, uh, through illustration, what was going to happen to Paul. Now, you will notice very clearly, uh, there is nothing here that says, don't go to Jerusalem. What is here is, Paul is, God is showing Paul that when he goes to Jerusalem, he will be bound and he will be turned over to the Gentiles for trial. And so, so this is it. It says, and when we heard these things, both we and they of that place, in other words, the people that were traveling, that would include Luke, by the way, we would include the writer of this. Luke, he says, he says, we... And they of the place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Why well, do you think about it? Here is Paul. He's been told he's, he's going to go to Rome. And he's been told a number of things by God. And now he's being told something opposite of these people. And the reason these people are saying what they're saying is because they believe what God has told them, that Paul will be bound and turned over to the Gentiles, and they are fearful for him. They love him, they care for him, and therefore they don't want him to go to Jerusalem. They want him to escape and avoid this particular di uh, dilemma that he would be in, and therefore they're just screaming out, and they're urging him not to go. Now, let's think of what they're doing. In their love for Paul, 
in their genuine love for Paul, what are they doing to the plan of God? What are they doing to the plan of God to reach, the, spread the gospel into Europe, into Rome, and not only that, but to actually bring the gospel to kings and high Roman officials? What are they doing to that? And they're, they're obviously, without realizing what they're doing, they're, 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 harming, they're, they're harming the cause. Now let's bring it up to today so that we can understand uh, what is going on here. Let's say a man, <clears throat> let's say a family member, decides that God <laughs> wants him to go to the mission field. And the mission field he wants him to go to is across the seas. And it happens to be in a very dangerous place where there is rebellion, where there is riots, there's revolution, um, all sorts of things. And uh, there's a religious uh, conflict. And he's going to go there and he's going to bring the gospel to people in that area. Immediately, the family senses the danger he is in. And they don't think of God protecting him, or they don't think of this is what God wants. They are looking at him, they love him, and they don't want him to be harmed. They don't want him to put himself in harm's way, where he might be uh, beaten or even killed. So they will urge him not to go. And to console their feelings about this, they will tell him, well, if God wants you to be a missionary, why can't you be a missionary? And they'll point to a safer place. I have seen this. I've seen this happen. Uh, I've had it in my own family. Um, my son-in-law uh, was going to take a pastorate. And the pastorate he was going to take was a number of states away from us. And with him was going to go... He, his six, our six grandchildren. In our hearts, we wanted him to stay. And we almost wanted, we were thinking, why can't you find a pastorate around the area, you know, where it's close enough for us to drive and visit on a, on a regular basis and so on, so we can get to know and, and uh, our, our grandchildren. So uh, we urged him to look in the area for a pastorate, etc. But God wanted him in a particular place. And I understood this. And I'm not, I didn't oppose this at all, but in my heart, in my heart, I felt tug like maybe he should stay closer to home. And uh, yet in my head, I knew this is God's plan for him. Therefore, he must obey God. This is the best thing for him. You know, and sometimes when we think of that, I've seen another other time, I've seen an incident where a man was said he was going to be a missionary and he became a missionary and he went to a particular place and this is where God had wanted him, etc. And uh, we had, the, the place was uh, turned very violent and he was afraid for the, his own safety so he went to a country that was much safer and he got out. And I thought to myself, is there any place safer than the will of God? If, if you are in the will of God, can you be any safer? Because nothing will come your way that will harm you. And literally, if you are doing the will of God and you are in obedience to God, then it is God who is in control and is in control of all the circumstances that surround you and all of your experience that you will have. And they're all used for your benefit. So Paul here is headed to Jerusalem because this is what he wants, that he believes God wants him to do. And these people realize that, and are told by God, that when he gets to Jerusalem, he will be bound, and he will be turned over to the Gentiles, and by turning him over to the Gentiles, since he is a, a Roman citizen, he has a right to appeal to Rome, to, and, uh, to the Caesar, and therefore he will be taken by the Gentiles and he will arrive at Rome. There, Paul does what he always does. He preaches the gospel. And that's the plan God has for him. But these people, realizing the danger in that plan, love him 
and do not want him to go, and they encourage him not to go. And what is Paul's reaction? He said, Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? In other words, he's saying, you, You're breaking my heart. And the reason you're breaking my heart isn't because you love me and, and oh, you're touching my heart so that I, I, I want to cry for your emotions for me. Uh-uh. If you read the rest of it, it says this, For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus. This is what his commission was. And therefore he, he saw them, what they were doing, he says, you're breaking my heart. You're breaking my heart because with your love and your great affection for me, you are opposing God's plan. That, that is basically what he's saying. He's saying, and I am ready to carry out God's plan. So now you've got a missionary, a, a member of the family rather, who wants to go on a mission field and he wants to go to a dangerous area. He feels God is leading him to a dangerous area and the family is urging him not to go and they're crying. I've seen this. Mom and dad are crying, oh, don't go, don't go there. And the child goes there anyway because the child is more in tune to God than they are. They are caught up in their love for their offspring. They don't want their offspring to experience experience the danger that may come their way. So here they are trying to stop them. It is no different here. These people love Paul. And they know by God's standard that Paul is going to uh, be bound. And he's going to suffer. And therefore they are fearful for him. And that love overcomes them. So when we look at opposition to the work of God in people's lives, in Christians' lives, uh, it's not, we don't, we can't blame Satan only. We have to blame ourselves many times. And even though we mean well, and, and we do, we mean well many times, not unknowingly, we are opposing the plan of God. And we are opposing the will of God. And I think they came to this realization. And it says this, And when he would not be persuaded, it says this, We cease saying, The will of God be done. In other words, it doesn't say they, they it's not, we gave up. As, and literally on, on the screen I have it, we gave up and said. In other words, we, we ceased, when it says we ceased, we ceased trying to persuade him not to go to Jerusalem is really what they mean. And they said this, the will of God be done. In other words, let's turn this over to God. It's his plan, so therefore it will work out all right. Now it says this, and after these days, we took up our luggage, and that is carriage does not mean here uh, some kind of buggy with wheels and a horse drawn. It said it's really luggage. And we went up to Jerusalem. Notice they're actually going south, but they're going up. The elevation is up. He says, There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea. In other words, certain disciples of where they're staying here was Philip. Manson of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. And they went on to Jerusalem and, and they lodged there. Next time we will talk about what occurs uh, in Jerusalem as the gospel, through Paul, hits customs, hits uh, behavior of people and, and customs of people and the way people do things and the way they live. And the, the issue has to be settled as to uh, what is the difference between doing something um, through custom and doing the same thing for salvation. In other words, you get this opposition. So uh, we'll discuss that next time and we will see Paul will end up uh, being bound. Uh, so until next time, I bid you Godspeed from on Victory's side. We'll see you next week.